Welcome to another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm Emily Jashinsky, culture editor here at The Federalist, joined today by my colleague, senior editor Christopher Bedford at The Federalist, and Terry Schilling, president of American Principles Project. Terry, thanks so much for joining us. I love The Federalist, so I'm really happy to be here. Well, awesome, me too. <laughs> <laughs> cool, Chris. Uh, <laughs> Terry, I want to start off by talking to you about something that we've actually written frequently on that um, APP has been doing, which is running ads on the Equality Act mm -hmm. in swing states. So Kentucky, Michigan, where else are these going? Uh, yeah, no, that's right. So right now for the 2020 cycle, we're running them in Michigan, Wisconsin, and we just raised another $300,000 to do a last minute campaign push in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. on these gender transitions for minors. Because in the town hall uh, that Joe Biden hosted, he endorsed uh, gender transitions for eight and 10 year olds. Eight year olds, dude. Eight-year-olds. Eight -olds. Eight -olds. Eight -olds. <laughs> that made me think of the big Lebowski. <laughs> it's a petter ass, dude. Uh, but um, look, this is an 80-20 issue. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Republicans have been leaving this on the table and not using it to make sure that Democrats independents know how crazy the Democratic Party is, it's just political malpractice. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to do the job of the Republican Party and make sure that every Democrat and every independent swing voter in Pennsylvania knows about it. Mm -hmm. and, and you've had good results. You've had good feedback from that. Mm -hmm. Voters and supporters are interested to see someone with a conservative intellectual pedigree like APP has, uh, not a, just an irrespected group that's willing to tackle this difficult issue head on. Right, yeah, and, and we're starting to get rewarded for that. So it, it was a long slog. It was a very cold winter for several years. No one wanted to touch this transgender issue because they really didn't get the politics of it. But, uh, you know, and I've been telling everyone, you know, last year, APP raised around $1.8 million. And because of our persistence in, in us working with donors and activists and politicians, we've now raised over $7 million for the 2020 cycle alone. So you go from $1.8 million to now over $7 million. That's incredible it's like growth. people care. It's it's and and it's not just that they care though. They now understand the politics of the issue, which is the them. biggest hurdle. Once you can convince donors and politicians that an issue is a winning issue, oh yeah, it's all downhill. And, and Suddenly, these pro LGBT establishment Republicans care about gender transitions for minors, which they should have cared about all along. And I think it's abuse. It's abuse, and that's why I think the story of APP is an indictment on the establishment Republican Party mm -hmm. because this is an issue that Republicans should have been on top of for years and years and years. I think there's a pushback from that because Republicans are loath to attack, and as they should be, anyone should be, to attack those who are mentally ill and those who are marginalized. But they, I don't think a lot of Republicans realize that that this is very political. That mm -hmm. this is this is not what it used to be. This is not people who are suffering from gender dysphoria. Adults. This is adults who are suffering from that. This is quack scientists and quack social workers pushing this on children who aren't old enough to go play at a friend's house. Forget about unsupervised. Forget about smoke a cigarette or vote or go through this and decide that they're boys or decide that they're girls. I mean, when children play with toys. Children mm -hmm. believe in fairies and dragons even more than the Irish. The, <laughs> like, th this is an issue and they're using it to attack women's sports, mm -hmm. to attack the military and military preparedness, mm -hmm. and to try and remake our society. And they always use this term safe space. It's like, uh, in my opinion, a safe women's locker room, having never been in one, would not have I, I a mentally ill adult man in it. It would... <laughs> And society can understand this. Society can appreciate these things. Like one of the greatest movies when I was growing up was the, uh, A Beautiful Mind mm -hmm. with the scientist Nash starring Russell Crowe. You're old. This, yeah, that's true. There's someone, this is a movie about someone who society respected. They were brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, but they suffered with mental illness and no right. one pretended that it was real. Right. No, that, that, and that's a very good point. And I, what I tell people is, look, there are lots of problems out there, but at the end of the day, mental illness or not, you still have human dignity. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so offensive mm -hmm. about the left's reaction when you suggest that something like gender dysphoria is a mental illness, when they say like, oh, how dare you compare this to a mental illness? Well, what is wrong with a mental, I mean, yes, obviously a mental illness is wrong. Give but me ADD any day. Right, right, right. <laughs> but the, 
look, you're still a human person. Mm -hmm. You're still you still deserve respect and care. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's an affront to the dignity of the human person yep. to deny the medical treatment that they need or, mm -hmm. or the psychological treatment that they need. They the left. What we are finding out is that the left are the real enemies of humanity. They're mm -hmm. the real enemies of human dignity and protecting people and giving them the care that they truly need and deserve. Um, and that's what's being exposed here. And you, you were talking about the kids and how they're not able to, to do all, you know, a lot of things, like go to their friend's house alone. I put it very simply. We don't let kids consent to sex. Mm -hmm. So how in the world are we going to let them consent to a sex change? Mm -hmm. We don't let kids have sex just because their parents let them do it. Painful and debilitating surgery that has no Irreversible. upside. Irreversible, that yeah. has no upside by any measurement that we've unfortunately been following because we've been doing it on their mental health. People right. don't feel better. They feel hurt. Right. Right. And I think Republicans staying out of this conversation because of whatever they came up with in Ryan's previous 2012 autopsy um, and their, you know, their <laughs> whatever they were thinking before that has really allowed, like, this is a great example of how they did this for the sake of political expediency. Mm -hmm. And they let the culture do so much damage. They let yeah. so much damage be done to the culture. I, I think the counterpoint that people would bring up to you, Terry, mm -hmm. is they would say, well, what about North Carolina? Mm -hmm. What about Rifra in mm -hmm. Indiana? Mm -hmm. And I imagine you have, uh, you know, a great, a great counterpoint to that counterpoint in and of itself. Yeah. Well, so, no, okay. So, a North Carolina, it drives me nuts when I hear people talk about how the trans issue was a disaster in North Carolina. Let's be very clear. When Economic you, hostage taken. Exactly. No, these these big corp. The biggest news flash to get today, if you're still a Republican and support corporations, they hate you. Corporations absolutely hate you. They want to destroy this country. They've been selling us out to China for the last several decades. They aren't American companies anymore. But what happened in North Carolina is these com companies who have been held hostage by the Chinese and these gender LGBT activists yes. decided to take a scalp and, and basically hold North Carolina and their economy hostage over bathrooms, over letting men who are biologically male access women's private spaces. That's what they decided to do. A hard fought victory for the feminist movement in the first place. Yes. Right, right, exactly. Well, every, the polling was very clear at the end of that race. When people heard the term HB2, mm -hmm. they viewed it as an economic bill. They didn't know what HB2 did. They just knew that, oh, this is the bill that is getting the NCAA to boycott North Carolina. This is the bill that's getting PayPal to pull out. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't know what it did. When you ask them, do you think that biological males should be yes. able to, to go into the women's private spaces, uh, everyone was against it. It was an 80-20 issue there again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at McCrory, okay? McCrory lost by less than 10,000 votes in an election where he, as an incumbent, was outspent 23 million to 50 million. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a landslide. So, like, you know, and on top of that, he did a lot of stupid stuff, right? Like, he distanced himself from Trump. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that, but Trump ended up winning the state by over 100,000 votes. But because McCrory thought that Trump was going to lose the election in a grand fashion, he distanced himself. Well, we saw how that played out for people that distanced themselves from Trump. They lose by 10,000 votes. On top of that, McCrory endorsed or signed uh, you know, toll roads into effect. No one likes paying more money for toll no roads. No one likes tolls. No one likes tolls. There were lots of Except reasons why government. McCrory lost. Exa yeah, if you're in government, you love tolls. Um, <laughs> but if you're a normal human being, you hate them. Well, I would submit that a reason that McCrory lost is because you look weak when you allow these lobbies, the LGBT lobby, to just trample over you right. for economic <clears throat> reasons. And I would apply the exact same thing to Mike Pence in Indiana right. when the Religious Freedom Restoration Act controversy sprung mm -hmm. up there. It's the same thing. People, It's Ronald Reagan talking about bold colors, not pale pastels. People are not attracted to weak leaders mm -hmm. who let themselves be trampled over um, whenever there's a sign of sensitive uh, or whenever there's like a whiff of a sensitive and here's a problem issue. the GOP has with the, to your point now Mitch McConnell no one's gonna call him a weak leader but he doesn't care about this mm -hmm. he cares about he cares about judges and he cares about campaign finance mm -hmm. yep. basically outside of Citizens United it's you're, you'll have a difficult time finding a campaign finance lawsuit that doesn't have his name on it right because and those are his issues he can't add low taxes, even that's just secondary. He'll do it. He'll get it through. He'll get whatever bill through. That's why you don't see him negotiating on coronavirus, because he's like, I've got other things to do. You guys figure it out. I'll push it through, because mm -hmm. he is a strong leader mm -hmm. on that. But on issues that matter a huge amount to the Republican base, abortion and and this, transgender issues, which mm -hmm. you have brought up, and, and a number of others, uh, immigration, the wall, to, to, 
among him and along with a lot of other elected Republicans would so much rather that be in their rearview mirror. Yep. Tech, tech monopolies, they want that behind them. Yep. They want to talk about the issues that they care about. Judges or the things that they think are easy and are really palatable. But we're, we're in a war of ideas that's taking real casualties and it's hurting children and threatening women and you can't allow that. No, no, that's exactly right. But the, the, going back to North Carolina and why McCrory lost, and this is actually why APP made the evolution to where it is now, mm -hmm. is McCrory signs this bill into law, this, this basically Christian right bill to restrict access to women's private spaces. He thought that the religious right was going to come in and spend millions of dollars to help him. And we met with him after the race. And he, so he get, we got to hear his firsthand take of this all. And he thought, you know, that the pro-family groups were going to come in with millions of dollars. And he was so disappointed at the fact that there was nothing. It's disappointing. There's nothing. It is disappointing. And, and the thing is, is like the pro-family movement and the Christian right, we do this time and time again. We let our leaders, our elected officials, who actually do what we need them to do, die. Yeah. We let them lose their election mm -hmm. because we either don't have the political will or the ability to raise the money to do it. You know, APP was one of the only groups that spent political campaign dollars in that 2016 race to help out McCourty. But we were only able to spend two, you know, $250,000 to help him. If I had another 500000 we could have shifted those 10,000 votes. And so... At that time, we were all over the place. We were fighting Common Core. We were uh, on religious freedom. We were all over the place. And I made the decision in 2016 to reshape APP to fill that political gap. Mm -hmm. And what I call it is the NRA for families. The same way the NRA organizes gun owners and politics to unelect the gun grabbers, we want to organize families and parents and politics to unelect the... Uh, child grabbers, I guess, you know, is what I would say. Child uh, snatchers, yeah. Yeah, the child oh my snatchers. Gosh. Um, Even in Texas, you see it. It's unbelievable. Oh, it, yes. That case in Texas with the the, the young little, the, the boy, uh, uh, James Younger, yep. is so egregious. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, I, I've talked to the father. He's, you know, he's a great man. He's willing to fight back. He's not taking this lying down. Um, and I imagine we'll, we'll probably start working with him. Um, after this, and that's election. another thing that's that great. people don't understand. Like Texas is Texas is red. Texas mm -hmm. is culturally conservative. So people assume that the Texas is governed by a party that cares about that. But if you go to Texas, which is a wonderful state, you'll notice that their leadership is very corporate, yep. very corporatist. Yes. They like highways. They don't like zoning laws. They like Business they care about taxes and businesses, and that's that's really it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And meanwhile, they're there are Christian fathers fighting to save their children from uh, crazy wives who have decided that are going to go through this. Ex-wives who are going to do that to their kid without any input. It's a, it's a fight that Republicans need to have. Well, I think that there's a real opportunity after this election in that there's an opportunity to reorient the Republican Party to be about what it truly needs to be about. Mm -hmm. So for, for the last few decades, it's been the Democrats have been reorienting society to have the government be the, the thing that unites us all. Mm -hmm. It's the government is the one thing that brings us all together. And the Republicans, on the other hand, have been basically saying, well, no, it's the free market. Mm -hmm. It's business that brings us all together. What the Republican Party needs to do is we need to acknowledge that the family is the one thing that we all belong to. That creating a strong family structure takes care of everything. It gets the government in its right order. It gets the, the, the free market in its right order. And if you just focus on getting people getting married mm -hmm. and making it easier to have babies yep. and to protect and raise those kids, you're going to have a much better time. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, you know, French fry when you're supposed to, to pizza on the, on the ski course. If you do that, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> um, and we need to reorient the entire Republican Party to be the pro-family party that you know, is pushing strong families and organizing society around the family. Something that's fascinating about this, and this can take us into the politics of 2020 a little bit, um, and maybe where you're running some of these ads and the response that you've gotten as you've been putting them on the air, we're onto Facebook, which is another thing we can talk about because you run into some uh, predictable issues with mm -hmm. Facebook uh, that actually speak to a much, much deeper problem with having this conversation in the first place. Mm -hmm. But something so fascinating is that You've made this evolution, and I think to some extent the Republican Party has made this evolution under arguably the most pro-LGBT candidate 
ever elected. Yeah. And it's largely because he's empowered Republicans to eschew political correctness. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? No, that, I think that's exactly right. Like, look, if you look at where I was going to disagree when you said no. <laughs> <laughs> The, listen, no, you idiot. The, the, this, <laughs> this, uh, this, this party, or this, where the country is, is like, right now, we don't really care. Like, if you're a grown adult, like, have whatever relationships you want to have. But leave our kids alone. Mm -hmm. That's, and that's what Trump understands. That's why his administration, through the DOJ and the Department of Education, have issued rulings on women's sports. They've issued uh, rulings um, to protect kids from this, you know, critical race theory stuff that's going on in schools. Uh, they're, they're, they get it. They get that, like, you know, Americans really don't care about what grown adults do in the privacy of their own bedroom, but they do want to protect kids and they understand the importance of families. Families are obviously different than, you know, what consenting adults do in their, their spare time for recreation. Um, having kids is a benefit to society and raising those, kid, those kids in a stable home leads to really good citizens in the future who are going to be great taxpayers, they're going to pay their social security, make it longer lasting, and they're going to go on to have even more kids and start businesses. The Trump administration gets that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they're not anti-gay bigots, uh, but at the same time, they want to protect families and make it easier for them to protect their own kids from all these mm -hmm. bad influences. And there's something about that where there's, there's a, there is a feeling in the country that since Donald Trump's been elected, Everything's a fight. There's nothing that's not a fight. Whether it's movies or television or Facebook and Instagram or internet or China or taxes or whether or not to wear a mask, every single thing is a fight. And my general thinking on that is that's not because Donald Trump is just fighting on every, or wants to start wars on every one of these fronts. It's because Republicans are always very narrowly focused on the issue of, of issues of regulation, taxation, and foreign policy. And he said, just like Andrew Breitbart said, like you're saying, like Ben Dominich and Sean Davis said when they started the Federalists, that this battle is way, 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 way bigger than these fiscal policies. And that there are left-wing encroachments into children's cartoon shows, into Sesame Street, into bathrooms, into gymnasiums, into schools, into sports, into the internet. Every aspect of your life is being taken over by this totalitarian group. And President Trump, that's been sports. President Trump was willing to say, well, we're gonna fight on every front then. Mm -hmm. if, we're sur like if we're surrounded, we get to attack in all directions. Right. Uh, and that's what's changed. So again, like let's go, we, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but mm -hmm. I wanna zoom in on the swing state ads that mm -hmm. you're running. Joe Biden made a comment at the first, it was, it was a town hall. Yeah, it was a town hall. It was, it was a town hall where he said, you know, if an eight-year-old decides that it's going to make them happy to be transgender, mm -hmm. uh, my administration would not, you know, would ban any form of discrimination against them, essentially. Which Nothing can, should stop them. Yes. So read between the lines on that. Mm -hmm. um, he also supports the Equality Act, and you've run ads, even before Biden made that yep. comment, you were running ads in the Equality Act. You have these in states where Republicans traditionally would probably say, you're running ads on transgenderism mm -hmm. weeks before the election. You're running ads against Wisconsin. something called the Equality Act? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But if you could speak a little bit to the, the content of the ads, how you're framing this issue, mm -hmm. and then the response that you've gotten. Yeah. So, look, it, it, it's just like the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Like, it's the Equality Act sounds really Great good. Great branded. Equal and, rights amendment. Yeah, and, and just the <laughs> Equality Act name alone, it's an 80-20 issue when you bring it like that. But once you dig into the numbers, like letting boys compete against girls' sports, letting children transition gender. And, and by the way, the Equality Act bans gender identity conversion therapy, which basically locks kids into the only, if you have gender dysphoria as a little kid, the only treatment that you can get is gender identity affirming care, which is basically a putting them on the path to sex changes. Because it conflates biological sex with gender identity. And, and it used right. to be called just normal society, like sports and boys coats and... Yeah. In church, right? But now I guess we need we need therapy, right? Um, but what we, what we found is that these issues are not only eighty twenty issues, but they're persuasive issues. Mm -hmm. So like, look, uh, you, you can test an issue and it can be an eighty twenty issue, but it might not move the numbers. It might not move the needle at all. But we've done extensive tests on all of our issues, from the gender transitions for children to transgender sports, the bathroom issue. The most powerful of all of those is actually the sports issue because mm -hmm. it shows. An inherent unfairness that everyone knows. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows that males have a natural biological genetic advantage over women when it comes to sports. Here's to us. Here's to us. Um, 
I'm just sitting here. <laughs> here to you. But, yeah, but, 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 but this is... like we're important. <laughs> Very important. Good luck. The crown, the jewel parents. and the crown of society. That's right. <laughs> but but pa- there are a lot of parents out there, there are a lot of dads out there who want to see their daughters succeed in sports. They don't want some guy who's been placing ninth, 10th, 11th place in these track meets yes. to be able to say, I'm actually a woman and always have been, and then go and start dominating the women's. And this is happening. I mean, this is, people are reading about it. Connecticut, Liberal Minnesota. State. These guys, this, there's this guy, JC Cooper in Minnesota, who has destroyed all of the women's powerlifting records. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, there will never be a woman that breaks his record. Uh, of powerlifting, whether it's the front squad or whatever. Which is important because of scholarships. It's, scholarships. it's not just the pride. It's also, it comes into scholarships and all of that. Right, exactly. And, and, and a willingness to compete and take part in these extracurricular yeah. activities. Right. If, if, if you're a girl and you're actually competitive, why would you ever join these leagues or do all of the hard work and practice and training for this when a guy can just come in and <laughs> steal all of your opportunities? It makes no sense. And that's why, you know, it's been a great pleasant surprise that even like you know Betsy DeVos is not a radical right-wing conservative she's totally like part of the establishment she's a great person and she's taken a lot of courageous stands including on this title night so you're seeing now like people like Betsy DeVos Mm -hmm. making these types of decisions to protect women's sports and and they're willing to stand up against this powerful LGBT lobby that has a ton of control and influence in society. And takes no hostages. They take no, they will destroy your life even after you apologize for the million times. You don't want to make a cake, you're done. Right, you're done. You're so done. You, you firmly believe that this is helping candidates like John James and his bid to unseat Gary Peters. This is helping Donald Trump right. in a place like Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. A, a million percent is, and we're seeing this in our ads that we're running right now, but we saw it in our testing too. In Michigan- Yeah, what's the testing show? So the, the testing in Michigan showed that the women's sports issue shifted the electorate 9.4 points towards Donald Trump from, from uh, Joe Biden. Now that's in a vacuum. So mm-hmm. the end results of, uh, of all of our ads is not gonna be 9.4%, but it'll be 3%, 4%, 5%, because we're targeting the 1 million most persuadable voters on this issue. So our goal is to shift 50,000 votes towards Trump out of that million. We're, we're trying to get to 5%. If we do that, that's the margin of victory most likely there. In Wisconsin, it was even more powerful. It was 12.5% on the women's sports, sports issue. Hmm. So these are issues that are persuasive. They, they move undecided. And, and the, the coolest thing about this is that we're, over 50% of our targets in, in these two states, Michigan and Wisconsin, are Democrats. We're not going after the base. Yeah. It's not like we're trying to turn out Republicans who are prone to our issues. No, we're educating Democrats about how crazy their candidate is. We'll talk about the suburban women that oh there's my so gosh. much conversation on. I imagine targeting <clears throat> some of these ads are actually successful with that particular yep. demographic. No, that's exactly right. This gets, look, it goes after all the demographics that Trump has been struggling with throughout his whole presidency, especially the suburban women. Mm-hmm. The other issue that we've tested is the Black Lives Matter movement mm-hmm. with the defunding uh, of police. That. The, the defunding of the police and the women's sports issue. Race riots aren't popular? Apparently not. You know, suburban who, women, who knew? this is weird, but suburban women like to feel safe in their homes. They don't want to that's, feel like the police won't trait. show up if someone tries to burn down their house. Um, so, but no, it's it's really incredible to see. And so we're, we're running the ads now and the, the results are incredible. The engagement rate, the completion rate of ads is around 76%, which means that for every ad we deliver to a voter, they're watching, 76% of them are watching it all the way through. So yeah. we've, de- we've delivered 39 million ads to people, and that's take that time 76%. We're kicking ass. I mean, th- there's no other way to put it. Uh, the religious right that didn't come out in North Carolina initially, one question is, have they come around? And also, who are some of these people, some of these organizations, I know it's not always popular to name names, mm-hmm. who Christian voters and cons- socially conservative voters are giving money to who aren't bringing it to the front. Well, okay, that's a really complicated question and issue to address, right? Because for for decades, it's been ingrained into the conservative movement that politics is downstream from culture. And that's just not true. It's half true. 
Politics influences culture just as much as culture influences politics. Mm -hmm. Politics is changing the law. And the Democrats have figured this out for a long time. You mean you're telling me that like the, the Catholic Church and, and all these Christian religions started embracing homosexuality and the LGBT movement before we started having changes in the law? No. The law is a teacher and it influences the culture and society. And so I I actually don't hold anything against all the pro-family groups out there. I really don't, because they are experts in their own field in their own way. They Family Research Council, for example, they don't really do politics, but you know what? I rely on them for policy analysis. Right. I rely on them for doing research and and telling us like what's exactly wrong with legislation and, and how to educate voters in the proper way. So like it's just about filling your role. And some people just don't have a political disposition. They don't like punching someone in the teeth. I love punching someone in the teeth, especially <laughs> when they're trying to take my family. So like I'm I'm totally fine with like all the group the Christian groups out there who are in their own lane doing their own thing. The only thing I don't like is when people say like, "Oh no, we shouldn't invest in politics." Politics right now today is our is the only area of our culture where normal everyday people actually have an influence. Right? Like, okay, you're you're going to fund money to make movies. You're going to compete with Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, you're going to yeah. compete with Warner Brothers and and MGM. Like, is that really what you? Oh, we're going to fund you know the the academia and the university system. You're going to go up against Harvard. Like, I mean, I we need Hillsdale, and we need everyone needs to do their own thing. But politics is our best opportunity where the people, normal everyday conservatives, actually can win in a very real way. So when you invest a, 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 you know a million yeah. dollars in a political race versus a million dollars into a university system, it's going to have a much bigger impact in My politics than the university. Going, uh, to Hillsdale, but there's a Republicans control the Senate. Right. So there is a, there's a difference in power right there. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Interesting. And you know, one thing I imagine is true is that while the cultural left thinks that the LGBT movement is a winning issue. The full LGBT agenda, mm -hmm. and when we say the full agenda, we mean gender transitions yep. for eight-year-olds and whatever else they prescribe. Eight-year-olds, dude. So far out on the fringe. While I think the cultural left that is in kind of these coastal bubbles, they think it's a winning issue. Mm -hmm. I doubt that you see, um, you know, groups that are part of the Democratic establishment running ads on these culture war issues in mm -hmm. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, where you guys are. They're not. Right. They, they don't, don't want to talk no, about it. They don't want to. <laughs> and, and the thing is that they, they... That says a lot. They would run the ads on the Equality Act. Oh, the, this candidate opposes the Equality Act. Well, that's why it's even more important for groups like APP to be able to run their ads. And this is what really sucks about Facebook censoring us is like, oh, okay, so the LGBT movement gets to run their ads saying that this is about equality. This, this is equality, equality, equality. Well, all we're doing is telling Taylor people Swift. the other end of what this bill does, right? Like, okay, so the LGBT movement gets to talk about equality, but we don't get to say, oh, no, but this would allow boys to compete in girls' sports. Mm -hmm. They're actually, they've actually banned us on Facebook from being able to say that. Well, this dovetails with the point you just made. Sorry to interrupt, but it does. That where ordinary people have a voice, they can't even have a voice on Facebook or mm -hmm. Twitter anymore if they want to say. Twitter will literally suspend your account if you say that a man cannot be a woman. That's, that's the least of it. You'll be fired from your job yes. in a lot of occupations. Yeah. If you own your own restaurant, your own pizza place, you will be fired from that you will not you will be boycotted people will attack you ostracized from the pta i was just in wisconsin your home state and we were an hour and 20 minutes west of the east of the mississippi into towards central wisconsin and this place went about for 20 points for donald trump and even there the people said that they preferred to have a boat parade or an atv parade because they don't want to alienate their customers if they have a business they don't want to even though it's a minority of people in that town who voted for 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 um, Hillary Clinton and are liberal, they don't want to alienate thirty percent of the business in their town, and they will. They'll be boycotted if they speak out. So they go out. They go out in the water. They fly the flag. They grill and they drink beers. They're kind of in the distance. No yeah. one can quite see them. They don't have a sign in their window though, because they'll be attacked. You know, it was tax cuts that got them to vote for Trump. <laughs> oh yeah, it was. It was, it was all they cared about in Central Wisconsin. Yeah, <laughs> marginal tax rates. Yeah, give me those tax. Rates. <laughs> I mean, everyone likes a tax. Cut. You're telling me this man is going to reduce the corporate tax rate. <laughs> we'll sign ah, me up. But, so, that, but that's another say, good I'll point, though. That's another indictment of the Republican Party and where it's been is that what they did with the tax code, mm -hmm. uh, with their tax reform law. 
look at what which part of the tax reform that they've made permanent and which part that they made temporary. Yeah. They made the corporate tax rates permanent and the individual and you know the tax cuts for families temporary. That is backwards. Like families need the certainty much more than businesses do. Businesses have so much more certainty than than families do. And you know, it just shows their priorities. I I hope that in 5 to 10 years we can get a Republican party that thinks the exact opposite way because of how badly corporations have betrayed the Republican. I mean, think about how much the Republican party bends over to please corporate America. Yeah. And how corporate America repays them is by attacking them. You saw Expensify sent out an email last night to all of their current prospective and former uh, customers endorsing Joe Biden and telling them exactly how and why to vote for Joe Biden. Expensify did? Expensify. Their CEO did. My it, apps have been blowing up. My Zoom, my Uber, my everything has been saying, don't forget to vote today. Yeah. Did my, you forget? Well, I haven't yet voted. But I was really annoyed that my phone started to send me notifications from like social media accounts mm -hmm. or from Grubhub. I don't, actually, I don't know <laughs> if Grubhub was one of them. But a lot of these different places had nothing to do with it that just pop it up and saying, don't forget to register. Yeah. It's, it's funny because people might say, like, I think we're all generally free market conservatives and corporate America has produced a lot of innovations that make our lives better and easier. But at the same time, the Republican Party has prioritized, like, the, the tax bill is such a great example and how that is completely backwards, families versus corporations. Mm -hmm. The Republican Party has prioritized the wrong thing over mm -hmm. and over again. And it weirdly took a um, pro-LGBT billionaire titan of real estate industry mm -hmm to knock some sense into the party. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, it, it's absolutely insane. And actually, this is this is interesting. So APP, we did a re research project on, on the political impact of family structure on elections. And what we found is not rocket science, but no one had done it yet. If you, we found that if you, know, if you get married and start having kids, you're much more likely to vote Republican. And if you're cohabitating, never married, single, don't have children, you're much more likely to be like, in, a Sandy Cortez, AOC. Um, and so like, you know, if the Republican Party was really interested in their future, they would be incentivizing family formation as much as possible. And there's a lot of cool things that we could get creative with. Like, there are a lot of benefits that we give to corporations that we don't give to families. Like, if a corporation, for example, has to pay to train their employees, they get to write all of that off of their taxes. But if I'm a family and I have five kids and, I, and my school system sucks, and I have to hire a tutor or send my kids to another school that I have to pay for, I don't get to write off any of that. I have to pay taxes on all of it. So there, we could level the playing field and treat families just as good as we treat corporations. And guess what? That would have the added benefit of increasing support among America's families, increasing the amount of American families, uh, and, and also, you know, having more kids. I mean, kids are really cool. You guys, I mean, you guys should try it. It's, <laughs> I've got I five. Wait. I've got a head start. Yeah, I can't tremendous. wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we close out this conversation, Chris? I don't know if you have another question, but I just want to say, regardless, so if Trump wins, if Trump loses, where do you see the Republican Party evolving on these issues? Do you think, um, you know, what's the sort of like the, the scenario in each mm -hmm. case? Do you think if Trump loses, the party just goes back to being, um, you know, this is... We're the party that prioritizes corporations and tax cuts. Mm -hmm. If Trump wins, do you think there's more of a, an inroad for groups like yours to continue mm -hmm. making this a focus of the Republican Party? What do you think is going to happen? I'm very bullish on reforming the Republican Party regardless of Trump wins or loses. Obviously, it'll be much better for the country and for our movement if Trump wins. Mm -hmm. um, it will. There are candidates and politicians and organizations that pose a threat to the Republican Party and whether or not we're able to continue to reform it and push it to being more of a pro-family and less yeah, corporate yeah. party. It, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, if you didn't hear Chris, uh, he said Nikki Haley. <laughs> that was a cough. <laughs> but, but there, are, there are others too that are just as big a threats. Um, but look, the thing is, all of the, the Nikki Haley types and the anti-Trump types, are, they are the corporate Republican, the Mitt Romney's like, there is no future in the Republican Party for the Mitt Romney's. And they can't wait to take over and exact vengeance on anyone who backs Donald Trump. But they're Trump. deluding themselves. They think that they're going to get that if he loses. <laughs> Jonah Goldberg, won't. triumphant. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to hate them so much if Trump loses because it's like, 
you're the reason we lost. Like you, you couldn't have a united party. Like if we lose by, you know, twenty thousand votes, which this election is going to be very close. If we lose by a small amount, and the Mitt Romneys and the Nikki Haley's and everyone that's been criticizing Trump, they're not going to have a shot at taking over the Republican Party. No one's going to say like, oh, well, we should have listened to you the whole time. No, they're going to say you screwed us. Like get the hell out, go join the Democrats, that's and we'll be we'll be a stronger party. Actually, I would rather the Republican Party be a party of trade union type guys, you know, the boiler makers, the, the, the electrical people workers. People who work with their hands. Exactly, because they are, there like are coders. people. Like they work who? With their, with the, the, the coders, they work with their hands. Learn, Learn to, to code. code. <laughs> Is that gonna get us banned? We just got banned, guys. This is videos for nothing. <laughs> Uh, but I, I look, I think the Republican Party is on a track to becoming a pro-family working class party. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. I think it's absolutely necessary. And if you look at the Democrats, they are the party of corporate America. Mm-hmm. And we should embrace that. We should push corporate America all the way over because it's been corporate America that's been selling out our workers. And for years, we were like embarrassingly like apologizing for corporate America, right? Like, oh no, they need to move to China in order to survive and give us cheaper goods. Like, don't you understand? Yeah, like soft power, right? You have cheap stuff to buy with food stamps now. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) The Democrats gave you (laughs) because I didn't want to. (laughs) But but at the same time, my gosh, we have a huge opportunity, and it's it's so exciting. Well, thank you so much, Terry. This has been a fascinating been conversation. Wonderful. I need one more beer, though. <laughs> I, I think Bradford can help you out with that. I think he has some actually under it. the table. <laughs> That's classic. Well, this has been another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm Emily Jashinsky. This is Christopher Bedford, Senior Editor at the Federalist. We're here with Terry Schilling from the American Principles Project. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back soon with more. Until then, be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fray. <laughs>